discoveries of the power of people talking about something to change their behavior. Lewin actually came up with a formula that a person's behavior, B, is a function of the person multiplied by their environment, the person and the environment. He said to Ron Lippett, it's much easier to change a group than to change an individual's behavior. If you want to change an individual's behavior in a team, let's say a management team, you're much more successful if you focus your attention on changing the norms and the, and the culture of that group, basically. Change the group, you change the individual. I know my, my father, incredible man, was an alcoholic. He used to go away when I was uh, young to get uh, uh, dried up, to get cured. He would come back and within a matter of weeks he'd be drinking again. Why? Because the family, the environment, the system hadn't changed. Levine and my mentor Ron Lippett and a, and a, a young man named Ralph White created this uh, experiment about leadership. Uh, uh, Ron Lippett had been a uh, a Boy Scout leader. He was very interested in the, in the, in the youth movement. And uh, he, was, he had a hunch that, the, that the, the, the attitude and the behavior of a leader, let's say on a camping trip, would actually have an effect on the quality of the experience that the kids had when they were camping. So they set up this uh, experiment. It's called the Lewin, Lippin, and White experiment. It's a classic. Um, Levine was behind the, this little uh, curtain with a camera photographing this thing. It's in, in a, a a black and white movie. And what um, uh, Lippitt and White did was they were leading a group of kids doing craft projects, making things after school. And they had two different kinds of leadership. They had an autocratic, dictatorial leader, high control, and then they had a democratic leader who was uh, participating and uh, providing structure. Well, halfway through the thing, they found out that, that Ralph White actually, when he was trying to be democratic, was actually laissez-faire. He just didn't do anything, and they found out that that was a third leadership style. So after doing this research, guess what? They found out that the democratic leadership style led to the most creativity, the most completed projects, and so forth. One of the first research findings that indicated that, there's a, that there could be a direct correlation between the behavior of the leader and the productivity, the performance, and the fulfillment of a team of people. Even though it was kids, the concept is still true. One of the most intriguing things to me about Kurt Levine is really encaptured in this story about how the T group, the training group, got started, which is one of the major ingredients in the founding of OD, as you'll see later. Um, uh, Ron Lippitt and Kurt Levine, here's what happened. The Connecticut uh, State Interracial Commission in America uh, was concerned about uh, prejudice in the school systems. In those days, at that time, in, in the Northeast, it was uh, Irish immigrants and Italian immigrants and so forth. It wasn't so much racial, though it was more, more cultural, but there's still some racial uh, things going on. But how can, how could we get the schools to deal with, with cultural differences more effectively? So Kurt set up this uh, experiment. And during the day, they, they, they had uh, uh, input about racism, they had uh, discussions about it, and so forth. And the researchers uh, were, were in the back of the room taking notes about what was happening in the room. Then at night, the staff would meet alone, and they would talk about what had happened in the room. Well, one night, one of the participants was looking for his lost jacket, his coat. And he wandered down into the, by the room where, this, where the staff was having this conversation. And he happened to overhear something that one of, the, one of the researchers was saying. And he stuck his head in the room and he said, that's not, that's not the way it happened. It happened this way. And one of the uh, young student researchers said, no, no, go away. This is a staff meeting. And Kurt Levine said, yeah, 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 come in, come in. He was fascinated with the difference of opinion between the, the participant and the researcher. Well, so they had this conversation, and what Kurt Levine realized was, instead of talking about prejudice, which is what was happening in the morning session, they were actually experiencing the fundamentals of prejudice in that conversation with these two different opinions about what was happening in the room, two entirely different perceptions. Well, the next night, all the participants came to the evening session because that became the here and now, Kurt Levine said. We're looking at it now in the here and now. And that's where that came from. The next year when they, had that, uh, when they had that same session, they designed the whole thing basically to be the evening session. And that's where the T group came from. It was called a sensitivity training group because it was training people to be sensitive to the dynamics of a group. 
Now, people on the west coast of the United States saw it as a very powerful personal growth vehicle because they saw the insights that people were having when they were sitting in these here and now groups. Shell Davis, for instance, was working at TRW, one of the very first OD people, and they were working with these T groups inside of an organization. So they had the manager and the members of, of the team come, and they did a similar kind of here and now group with those very people. And they found out that when the people worked together as a team and shared the T group experience, then there was an impact on the organization. Now, while Levine was doing this work in America, over in England, a guy named Wilfred Bion, a psychologist, and he had responsibility for helping uh, traumatized soldiers that were coming back from World War II to recover from their psychological difficulties that had been created during the war. And there were so many of them, and he had so few uh, counselors that the, he decided to work with people in groups instead of one-on-one. -on -one. And what he found out was that while he or his colleagues were working, let's say, talking with one soldier, the other soldiers were starting to, to talk with each other, and Beyond figured out there's some really good work going on in the group other than what the therapist is doing with this one person. So he decided to experiment with uh, doing the therapy in a group. One of the very first times that, that something like that uh, happened, and of course he found out that the, the help that was being given by the colleagues was quite often equal to, if not sometimes superior in value, to the help that was being given by the therapist that was in the group. In addition to that, he helped the British Army. They were trying to figure out how to select the best officers for the British Army. And the, the, the procedure that they had involved a lot of tests and you know, written tests and interviews and things like that. It took several days to, to go through, and somebody had to pore over the data and so forth. So uh, Beyond said, well, let's, let's create a, a sort of a, a laboratory a simulation, we would call it today. So they would put the, several of these people together, and they'd give them some kind of a task to accomplish, and they would simply watch what happened. And in a matter of, of, of a, a couple of hours, they were actually able to see the people that had the leadership ability without, without, all, without all the tests. So those were the first experiments in leaderless groups. They had a lot to do with that. Bion was the one who figured out that in those situations where the leader of the group was very strong, and provided structure that the members of the group responded. They would either fight, they'd either resist the leader, they would pair off, leave, check out in some way. But if the leader of the group focused instead of talking at the people, began to focus on the process, what was happening in the room, then the members of the group began to focus on what he called work, the actual work that was going on there. Very powerful, very powerful insights. A couple of his colleagues, Eric Trist and Fred Emery, made, I think, equal to the T group and its impact, this amazing discovery in the South Yorkshire mine. At that time, uh, during, right after World War II, the mining, the coal mining, was, was being done in what was called um, long wall mining, where a group of people would go down into the mine and everybody had a particular job. Just a, it was very Taylor, remember, remember Taylor? Everybody had a particular job and they had to do just this one job. And then they would leave, and the next shift of, of miners would come in, and they would have to spend the first half of their shift correcting the mistakes and figuring out what had happened with the, with, with the last group of, of, of miners. Well, one of these miners uh, went off to graduate school, and uh, went to graduate school with uh, Eric Trist, a guy named Bamforth. And Bamforth went back into the mines after he'd been at grad school for a while and was absolutely stunned at what he saw. The miners themselves, with the, uh, with the collaboration of a, of a courageous manager, had changed the way they were doing it. And they were now doing what was called short wall mining, where everybody on the team did everything. Basically, the team was responsible for what happened in that section. It was kind of a, one of the very first examples of, of people learning everybody else's job. So they broke apart. They took Taylor's thing, which had everybody doing separate jobs, and they put everybody in the, in the group doing, uh, doing, in a sense, sharing responsibility for what happened during the shift. Productivity, of course, just, just soared. So it was one of the very first examples of self-managed teams. Eric Trist apparently went down into the mine. Bamforth said to his teacher, you've got to see this. Trist says, in a quote to Marv Weisbord, that he said, I went down into the mine. He said, I came out a different man. The last of the four big giants is a man named Douglas McGregor. 
I wish we had more time to go into the details. He is the one who came up with theory X and theory Y management. You maybe know the fundamentals that theory X managers are those who believe that control is the solution. You have to, you have to coerce or, or uh, motivate. It's up to the manager to figure out how to get people to do things because fundamentally in theory X uh, philosophy, people are lazy. Go back to Taylor again, see? In Theory X management, people are lazy, irresponsible, they're going to try to get away with as much as possible, they don't want to work very hard, and so forth. Theory Y theory of management says, you know what? Fundamentally, people are responsible, they want to excel, they'd like to do really well, they want to learn on the job. And these two management philosophies, if you put them side by side, uh, they're still around today. Now, McGregor did uh, his work and he said, what would happen if people began to manage using theory Y management philosophy. When he wrote his book called The Human Side of Enterprise, 1960, it just took the world by storm. It was quite an extraordinary piece of work. It was McGregor who invited Levine to come from Germany to MIT, interestingly enough, to the School of Engineering, not to the School of Psychology. It's fascinating to think of what might have happened to OD if it's, if it's first sort of uh, founding moments had been in the School of Psychology, which at that time was mostly about pigeons and rats and so forth. It was very Skinner, very operant conditioning. And instead, it was in the School of Engineering, which is about how can we, how can we make things work? It's fascinating how that happened. McGregor took a very practical approach. He was the one that came up with, with, with the whole notion of, we've got to make this useful to large numbers of managers. So when his book came out, it just swept the country. Extraordinary, very, very uh, a powerful, sort of application-oriented giant in the field of OD. Okay, we've looked at the, the roots of OD, the ancient roots of OD. We've looked at the giants of OD. Now let's look, look at what is it? What is OD? Here's a working definition from my colleague Billy Alban and myself. This is uh, excerpted from our chapter in the Practicing OD book. We say organization development, OD, is the application of action research and systems theory. So it's the application. It's not, it's not done in a library. It's done in the real world. It's an application of action research, going back to Levine again. It is, it is finding out what's happening with people in a way that involves the people themselves in the finding out. And it uses what's called systems theory. This is how we stumbled onto systems theory. Dick Beckhard, uh, one of the early pioneers, in fact, one of the people who claims to have named the field of OD along with one of my mentors, Herb Shepard, 1957, they both sort of independently came up with the name of organization development. Uh, Beckhardt was doing a, a project, uh, an OD project, uh, with, a, with a group of people, and uh, he came back a little bit later to find out that the whole thing had fallen apart. Why? Because the supervisors and the managers had not been involved in the small groups. Bingo, aha, there is a system at work here. You can't just take an isolated part of the system, like you can't take the alcoholic out of the family. You can't just take one segment of an organization that has, that's interdependent with other parts of the system and expect a change to take because the rest of the system will force that group back into its old habits again. So OD is the application of action research and systems theory using participative processes with human systems. Two key points. Par participative processes. It uses processes. That means people are actually doing something together. It's not just giving people uh, things to read, it's actually processes, and they're participative. The people are actually, the, the people who, are, who, who need to be changed, let's say, the people who need to discover something are participating in it themselves. They're in the process. They're not like waiting for an expert. See, in Taylor's system, the consultant was the expert who figured out what needed to be done and then came in and then told people what they should do. We know what happens now. There are, there are great plans in bottom drawers all over the world where consultants have come and told people what to do. Probably brilliant, absolutely right on. Recommendations about what to do and nothing happens. Why? Because the people did not participate in a process that developed those recommendations. So OD uses participative processes with human systems. Works with technology 
but it's not just a technological uh, intervention. It, also, it focuses primarily on the human system that is, in fact, using the technology. The goal is to increase the internal and external effectiveness of that system and its stakeholders. The goal is not to make people feel good. The goal is not to make people happy, although those are quite often uh, the sort of the unintended consequences of a well-done OD project. That's not the focus. The focus is to increase the effectiveness internally and externally. In other words, Inside the organization, you want the, there to be an increase in effectiveness of how departments and people interact with each other and levels. But you also want that internal effectiveness to make a difference outside in the larger world, the way that organization interacts with, with its customers, with its vendors, with its clients, with, with the rest, with the rest of, the, of the world. It involves all the stakeholders in that organization, whoever has a stake in the success of that organization in some way in a well-done OD project is involved in the process in appropriate ways. And the tagline is that all this is going on to help the organization work with change. It's really all about change. If you look back to the roots of, of, of OD from the very beginning to Karg and his Neanderthal buddies around the campfire trying to figure out how to kill the mastodon with fewer casualties, it's all about changing something. It's all about going from the way things are to the way they could be or the way they should be. That's a working definition of OD. So what did we learn from all these people? From Levine, no research without action, no action without research. You know, that's absolutely key, that uh, everything is connected, especially technology and people. You can't just work with one part of the system. You have to work with the whole system. Change is the only constant. Change is the name of the game. OD is about change, whether it's working with an individual and coaching, a team of people, the whole system, or a multinational global system. Small groups are the key. Kurt Levine showed that the most powerful vehicle for creating changes in attitude and changing a culture are small task-oriented groups that come together around a common mission. Very powerful. Small groups are the key. From Ron Lippett, I learned the people who give you the data, if you're gathering data, the people who give you the data own the data. They are the ones who need to be involved in implication derivation, what Ron Lippett called implication derivation. It's not enough for an expert to go off and look at the data and say, hmm, I see what this data means. Get the people in the room. Get a cross-section of the people in the room and ask them, what does this tell you about the organization? Then they will own, and you know what? They will see things that the expert will not see. Break existing patterns with people. That's the fundamental thing. OD is about breaking existing patterns with the people who are trapped in those patterns. That's the key, by involving them. And finally, leaders must be authentic human beings as well as technically sharp. They've got to be smart above the waterline in technology, and they've got to be wise in the area of what's now called emotional intelligence. If you want to find out more about this, the, the roots of OD and where we came from, which I highly recommend because I've just <laughs> gone very fast over the surface, I recommend, I urge you to get Marvin Weisbord's book called Productive Workplaces. Much of what I've said today comes out of his book. He knew many of these people. He's a very dear friend and colleague, highly, very readable, highly recommended. Another book to find out more about Kurt Levine is Alfred Morrow's book called The Practical Theorist. Very, very readable. Uh, it's fascinating. This man's life was incredible. And then finally, my Bible, which is really the handbook for those of us in this field, called Practicing OD. Bill Rothwell and Roland Sullivan are the editors. Roland's a good friend of mine. These are two great guys. I highly recommend this book. It's really the only book you'd ever need if you wanted to know about OD. Pick up these books and study them. Study them. So I hope you see now who the people are that are, that are beneath us in our family tree, our OD family tree, the people who, who planted the roots, the people who, who gave us the tree and maybe even the branch that we're on. Can you see now these, all these various branches of OD? There's survey feedback, there's team building, there's strategic planning, coaching, leadership development, there's work in the human spirit, there's large-scale change, conflict utilization, appreciative inquiry, all these things now that we do based on action research that came from these founders. Every day, every day that you do OD, you need to thank these giants because we're standing on their shoulders. Thank you.
Well, greetings to all my friends and colleagues in Bangkok for the Asian OD Network meeting. Thank you for inviting me to be with you, even though it's got to be a, a virtual participation today. Uh, Doug O'Loughlin, my friend from Singapore, asked me to talk a bit about my history in OD and management and perhaps some of the implications for the world we live in today. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories uh, about my own history and life, life in the world of organizations and communities. I, I should mention that uh, since 1985, that's 23 years, I have been the beneficiary of a particular kind of medical treatment called acupuncture. And the person that I received treatment for was trained in traditional Chinese medicine. Now the interesting thing about this particular treatment is that the acupuncturist does not necessarily put the needles where the trouble is, nor does the acupuncturist seek most of the time to cure systems. What my acupuncturist does is a systemic treatment. He tries to treat the whole system in such a way that there's improvement across the board. Now the interesting thing about this whole system technology, if you will, is that it's 5,000 years old. There's nothing new about the idea of improving whole systems. In the organizational world, our understanding of improving whole systems is scarcely 50 years old, if that. Uh, but the idea is not an entirely new idea. I started in the management business back in the 1950s as a very young man when I became an executive in a small business. And in the 1960s, I began experimenting with what, with what later came to be called self-managed work teams, work teams where people work without supervisors and have responsibility for their own tools and techniques and customers and decision making. I left that business in 1968 and by 69 I was consulting full time for a living in a profession that I later came to know as organization development. My clients in, for the next 20 years were largely large corporations and also medical schools and hospitals. When I started in the consulting business in 1969, what they were teaching in business schools is that organizations reorganized every seven years. If they were centralized, they decentralized. If they decentralized, they centralized. If they were in the aerospace business or, or if they were in the chemical business, they had a matrix and tried to have it both ways organizationally. Uh, if you were in the consulting business, this set up a delicious a paradox and also a wonderful opportunity because you could study uh, a client's problems for a year or a year and a half and then take a year and a half or two years to overcome all the resistance that was inevitable once you made your consulting report and then you might have three or four years of stability until the next cycle. There was also a, a wonderful irony in this because you already knew before you started interviewing people that if they were centralized you were going to decentralize them and if they were decentralized you were going to centralize them. And the reason is that each of these organizational forms eventually outlives its usefulness. Centralization squeezes out creativity, but it makes for efficiency. De decentralization eventually leads to, lack, to loss of control, even though it, there can be enormous creativity and innovation in the meantime. Well, in any, way, in any case, the important point is that this seven-year cycle became a five-year cycle in the 1970s. And by the early 1980s, this reorganization business was an annual event. And by the time I left full-time consulting in 1992, the pace was nonstop. There was no stabilization in systems anymore. We were into nonstop change. In 1981, my consulting company was hired by the Bethlehem Steel Corporation. This is one of a long list of iconic American companies that we consulted with in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s that no longer exist. But Bethlehem Steel in, Bethlehem Steel in 1981 was beginning to 